So again, we are going to continue in 1 Thessalonians. Um, The last time we looked at chapter 2, and we're going to look at chapter 2 again. And so just for the sake of uh, memory, let's read chapter 2 again. We're going to read at least the first 16 verses this morning. So please follow along with me as I read the first 16 verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul writes, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you, believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out, and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them at last. Now, in our previous look at chapter 2, I focused on the gospel message itself. I talked about the nature of the message and the fact that God's word is living and active and powerful and effective. And our responsibility is not to add to it, or to take away from it, or to alter it in any way in an attempt to make it more appealing or more effective. Our role is simply to boldly proclaim it and leave the results up to God. And so my focus was on the message. Today, my focus is going to be on the messengers, at least some aspects of the messengers. Paul used imagery of treasure and jars of clay, and the last time we were talking about the treasure, and now we're talking about the the clay jars, which is referring to us. And there are many, many things that I could say I was discovering about the nature of the messengers. But today I'm just going to limit it to a few things about Paul and his companions here in chapter 2. And um, I'm not intentionally keeping with the theme of M words, but that's what it is today. We're going to look at the motives and the methods of the messengers. So that is our two points today, the motives and the methods. So let's start with motives. Paul certainly tells us here what our motives should not be. He says his motive and his companions was not deception in verse 3. There was no intention to deceive. No attempt, he says, to deceive. Their goal was to faithfully proclaim the message. Their goal was the truth. And he says in verse 5 that their motivation was not greed. He says, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. They were not trying to take advantage of others for their own gain. But isn't that what we're used to from the world? If you're like me, you probably do not answer your phone if it's a number you don't recognize. And why not? It's because 
it's likely someone trying to deceive you for, your own, for their own gain. You already know this, right? There's many versions of this. Uh, I've had some that called and said that my computer's Windows license had expired and I needed to talk to their representative to pay to get the, uh, the license renewed. I recently got a call saying that my, there were suspicious charges on my Amazon account and I needed to talk with someone to get it resolved. But they didn't even say it right. I think they said they pronounced it specious charges instead of suspicious. Um, uh, maybe a wealthy person in Nigeria needs your help and will reward you handsomely if you help them. Um, here's one I got one time uh, that I had won the Canadian lottery that I had never even played. And all that I had to do was send off a small amount of money for some paperwork and processing and they would send me the money. Which is funny because then in a day or two I went to work and a coworker said, I'm probably not going to be working here much longer. I just got notified I won a Canadian lottery. <laughs> so I guess it works on some. Um, but this kind of scam is, it's the way of the world. You and I know this very well. And this also, unfortunately, is used in connection with religion often and even Christianity. For example, maybe you've heard a quote by L. Ron Hubbard, who was the founder of Scientology. He had been a science fiction writer and then one day he said, maybe you've heard this quote, writing for a penny a word is ridiculous. If a man wants to make a million dollars, the best way would be to start his own religion. And then he did start his own religion. Imagine that, that he literally said exactly what he was going to do, and yet people still uh, were deceived by the lie. A false religion, religion like Scientology may seem like an atypical example, but we see this deception and greed supposedly from supposedly Christian public figures all the time. You know them when you see uh, these prominent prosperity gospel preachers on TV. For example, one televangelist that wanted a new private jet, and he said his need for it was because he can't talk to God while he's flying commercial. And then another televangelist had three jets, and he needed a new one that was a $54 million jet. And his rationale, he said, is Jesus had had the option, he would have chosen a jet over a donkey. Never mind that he had failed to realize the significance of the donkey. Um, this is a complete distortion of the gospel. Paul was trying to distinguish himself, to distance himself from those who are out for only personal gain or personal fame and prestige. Paul was not a charlatan. He was, not, uh, he was, he was bringing the truth and he wanted nothing in return from them. One commentator said, It is the character of life that separates true from false prophets. Persons in both the religious and philosophical communities of the first century felt that the only teachers worth a moment's attention were those who taught with their lives as well as with their words. And so we are called to proclaim faith in word and in life. And so Paul and his companions, they they opened up their lives to the Thessalonians, sharing their lives with them. And Paul said they had no intention to deceive or to gain personally. In fact, they even supported themselves so that they would have no need to take anything from the Thessalonians. They were not seeking approval or acceptance by people. They were not seeking fame or popularity. They were not trying to get millions of social media followers like we see today. And so then what were their motives? What are the proper motives? What should our motives be? Well, I think it's reasonable, as I was thinking through this, to summarize the proper motives of our gospel proclamation using the two greatest commandments. Love for God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love for neighbor as ourselves. Because just as these two commandments fulfill the law and the prophets, they will suffice as our correct and appropriate motives in proclaiming the gospel and making disciples. We proclaim the gospel because of our love for God and because of our love for our fellow man. So first, we should be motivated by our love for God. Why? Because we've already seen, for example, in our study of Jonah and in Pastor Charlie's messages from Mark, that we serve a God who has love and compassion for the lost. And that's why he sent Jonah to the wicked city of Nineveh to call them to repentance so that they might be forgiven and saved. And God had pity on them. 
Or consider John 3.16, that most well-known of verses that asserts that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. God has a heart for the lost. He has a heart for missions. And so if we have the mind of Christ, if we have been born of God, then we too should have a heart for missions because we too should love the things that God loves. And I believe it's important that we start with this as our primary reason for sharing the gospel because for one thing, people can be very hard to love. Jesus tells us to love our enemies and pray for them because this is not something that we just do naturally. It's hard to love our enemies. It's hard to love people in general because people are often unlovable. And so we love people because God tells us to and because He loves them. And also, I think we start with this one because, with our love for God because it can be difficult at times to generate a love and concern for an abstract concept like the lost. It can be hard to have a burden for people we've never seen or for simply a category of people or statistics and numbers. For example, think of 9-11. It's not easy to be emotional about a number like 3,000 deaths But then when you hear, you know, the 911 call from someone who's in the building and is scared, or you hear the the voicemail from the man who, the husband who's calling his wife from the airplane, telling her he loves her and goodbye, knowing that he's not going to make it, then your heart gets stirred up inside. Or maybe think about our time right now in COVID. You know, you hear that over 500,000 have died, and it's really hard here in America, and it's hard to grasp that number people just come to statistics. But then it changes when one of those deaths is a parent or a grandparent or a close friend. And so similarly, we may have a burden for lost people that we know and we love personally, but it may not be easy to generate a concern for lost people we don't know, just as Jonah was not really concerned about the city of Nineveh. And so I think we let our love for the Lord motivate us to seek out the lost with the gospel because we desire to see his name known and worshiped throughout all the earth. And also, it's a matter of obedience. Our obedience is a demonstration and an outworking of our love for Christ. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And what did Jesus tell us we're to be doing as believers? He said he was sending us with all of his authority in heaven on earth to go and to make disciples of all the nations, to baptize them and to teach them to observe all that He has commanded. And so we have our mission and we have our instructions. And so our first and primary motive, I believe, is our love for God and for His glory. We want His name to be hallowed among men. We want His name to be known and glorified among the nations. And so, as Paul says in verse 4, he says, We speak not to please man, but to please God, who tests our hearts. And the second motive, the greatest, second greatest commandment, to love our neighbors as ourselves. I want you to listen again to what Paul says about the Jews in verse 15, who not only killed the prophets and Jesus, but also attempted to hinder Paul's mission and ministry. So, in verse 15, we're starting one or two words before, he says, the Jews, and then in verse 15, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Paul says that the Jews, by hindering his attempts to preach the gospel to lost people, they were opposing all of humanity. It's an interesting thing to think about for a moment. You know, if there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus, if there is only one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, then this is the message that humanity needs the most, which means that the most loving thing we can do is for people to proclaim it to them and to hinder the preaching of this message is to set yourself in opposition to all of humanity. And so even though the world often calls the gospel a message of hate, we believe it to be a message of love and the only source of hope for humanity. 
So our motivation is to proclaim it out of love for our neighbor. And this brings me to the second aspect of the messengers, which is the method of the messengers. In approaching this topic of our our method of evangelism and discipleship, I want to focus on a couple of metaphors or, or analogies here that Paul uses, imagery here. He uses the imagery of a mother and a father. First, the mother analogy. In verse 7, Paul says, But we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. So like a mother, Paul and his companions demonstrated a a selfless affection. They shared not only their messages, but also their lives with the Thessalonians. And they worked night and day, he says, for the sake of the Thessalonians. And then in verse 11, Paul says that he was like a father to them. In verse 11, he says, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. This was a role of instruction. Like a father, Paul was encouraging them and providing guidance and training. And rather than getting into the specifics here of of the roles of fathers and mothers. What I want to really do is just focus on the role that parents play in general. Paul here says he's playing the role of both in a way. So let's focus on parenting for a moment as a model of evangelism and discipleship. I think all of us can relate to this on some level because either we are parents or we have parents or we have had parents. And so what do parents do? Parents are entrusted with children And they do whatever they have to do to nurture and protect and instruct those children in order to equip them to survive on their own. And if they're believers, they hopefully do whatever it takes to help their children to know Christ and to treasure Him above all else. And so they invest their time into them. They invest their money into them. They make sacrifices for them. They instruct them and they love them. They do everything for them. They do whatever it takes. They go without sleep sometimes. They set aside some of their own personal interests and hobbies. Their lives become centered around their children. They give of themselves constantly and completely. And Paul says here, he and his companions did not just give the Thessalonians their gospel message. He says they shared their own lives with them. They gave themselves. And so how does this apply to us? Well, my answer is that we are all called to make disciples. So in some ways, we are all called to this parenting mindset on some level in evangelism and discipleship. We are disciples of Christ, and one of our roles is to make disciples. We are disciple-making disciples. We are disciples who make disciples. And Jesus said that if we want to be his disciple, we must first count the cost. And I can't help but wonder if perhaps what Paul is saying here is part of that cost that Jesus is talking about. Yes, persecution is a major aspect of that cost, but perhaps it's also the cost that comes with discipleship. Because I'm compelled to think that perhaps much of the cost of discipleship is the self-sacrifice of disciple-making. The doing whatever it takes to help people know Christ and love Christ and grow in Christ. It's the hardship list that Paul listed for the Corinthians. His becoming all things to all men. It's the process of dying so that others may have new life. And while this cost may be thought of most often with missionaries and with pastors, I think it applies to all believers as disciple makers. We are all called to these things, uh, to, to putting aside our personal desires and wishes for the sake of others, just like parents. So what do parents put aside for their kids? 
often it's, it's everything. They put aside date nights. They put aside, as I said, sleep, maybe fun vacations. You can do that with kids, but maybe, you know, things like a, a cruise or something. Hobbies, you know, the, the man cave maybe has to go. Um, in parenting my five kids, my desire for alone time, my desire for sleep, my desire to just watch a ball game or watch a movie, it gets, all these things tend to get put aside. Things I want to own often get put aside. My own parents, for the sake of my education, they put everything aside and sacrificed to send me to an expensive private school. These are the things parents do for their children. It's like the mother rabbit that, that runs away from the, the nest to draw the pet predator away. I, was, I saw a, a thing, a nature thing this week, and it was about a giant Pacific octopus. And uh, this is kind of a dismal story here, but it said uh, that the females, the females lay their eggs, and then the female stays with them for sometimes even months until the babies emerge. And they said during that waiting time, she doesn't eat or move. She just wastes away. And then once the eggs successfully hatch, she dies. I don't know if I can tell that story when my girls are here in the next service. Um, but, uh, but the question is, is this how Paul viewed evangelism and discipleship? Am I reading too much into these parenting analogies? Well, listen to what Paul says elsewhere. To the Corinthians, he sounds very similar to this, like, he, like he's writing to the Thessalonians. He says, I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours, but you. And then he says, for children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. It's like the octopus there. He says, for we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. In other words, Paul is always dying, in a sense, for the sake of others coming to Christ and knowing Christ. He says in Philippians, Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. So Paul told the Philippian church that he would prefer to depart, to be with Christ, but if he remained, it would be for the sake of their progress and their joy in the faith. Paul told the Corinthians that he had become all things to all men in order that he might save some, even putting aside his rights in order to do so. And he also gave him a list of things he endured for the sake of his mission, shipwrecks and imprisonments and hunger and sleeplessness and being whipped and being stoned, and the list goes on and on and on, all for the sake of those he hoped to reach for Christ. It's about daily dying to self, picking up our cross and following But we all must, I believe, share in this cost and help to pay it for one another. We may not all be apostles. We're not all spiritual fathers to the church like Paul and John and Peter and James. But we can relate to this concept of sacrifice for the spiritual well-being of others. One commentator said, Far from seeking any material help from their converts, they were eager to share with them all that they had and indeed all that they were. No other attitude would befit the preachers of a gospel which proclaimed as Lord and Savior one who emptied himself for the enrichment of others. Jesus conducted himself among his disciples as a servant. From his example, they were expected to learn that they in turn should be servants to one another and to their fellow men and women. And so Jesus set the example and and we all are to follow it. It's about pouring ourselves into others throughout this entire discipleship process. For me, it's helpful, I think, to think of discipleship as, as sort of a, a timeline or, or maybe a spectrum, and we're all somewhere on that uh, timeline. We're all somewhere on it, but at different stages. It's a timeline that includes a new birth, being born again, being adopted, adopted as children of God, and then progressing until... Uh, toward maturity and then to death. And so evangelism and discipleship are, are two parts of that one process. Like Paul says, one plants and one waters. 
and God gives the growth. They're just different stages of the timeline. Both are about taking a person who does not yet know Christ and getting them to a point of spiritual maturity, just like a parent does with a baby. And so on this timeline, you have, you have some who have not yet heard, but they need to hear. And then you have some who have heard, but they've not yet believed, and they need to come to faith. And you have some that have only recently believed and are still young in the faith, and they need to reach maturity. And hopefully they don't stay there, but they do go on to maturity. And then you have some who have matured in the faith, and they have wisdom and experience to offer. And we're all called, I think, to be a part of this whole process with each other. So we pour ourselves into others throughout this process, even at great cost. We do whatever it takes to help them love and treasure treasure Christ, and we continue doing whatever it takes to help them on to maturity. So that Paul can say in Colossians 1, Him, that is Christ, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. And so then, our method becomes whatever it takes, within biblical parameters, of course. It's doing whatever we have to do. We don't get attached to certain traditions or methods or preferences. So a question like, do we do small groups or do we do Sunday school? The answer is, whatever it takes. Do we meet outside or inside? Whatever it takes. Pews or lawn chairs? Whatever it takes. I have not been on the mission field before, but I have been on mission trips a number of times, and they always had the same theme, which was flexibility. They would always say, we're going with a plan, but we're not attached to the plan. Who knows what we'll find when we get there? Who knows what the circumstances will be? So we'll use whatever we have to use and we'll do whatever we have to do. And that's the mindset. And so like Paul here in Thessalonians, for the sake of the Thessalonians, like him, we we labor and we toil night and day. We share the gospel and we share our lives with one another. So let's strive to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Let's strive to love our neighbors as ourselves, and we'll do whatever it takes. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Father God, I thank you, Lord, that you did not leave us in our sin. I thank you that you came for us. Lord, you you predestined us in Christ. You called us by the gospel, you justified us. One day you will glorify us. I thank you, Lord, that you sought us out and are bringing us through this process. Father, I thank you for those like Paul and his apostles and his companions. Lord, I thank you for those, um, even just in my life, that brought the gospel to me. Father, I thank you that you Um, that even though we are flawed and weak jars of clay, you still see fit to use us in this process of spreading the gospel and bringing others to faith and helping them to grow in their faith. I thank you that you did not leave us isolated, but you gave us your church, that we are all part of one body with different gifts, and we all can work together to encourage one another and to build each other up in our faith. Lord, help us to Follow the example of Paul. Help us to pour our lives into others' lives so that we can help them come to Christ and grow in their faith as well. Father, help us to do it because we love you and we love those that you have created in your image. Thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray and do all of these things. Amen.